but we are honored to have the author of Red House Island, Red Island House, shame on me, uh, <laughs> Ms. Andrea Lee joining us. And I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Ms. Lee. She was born in Philadelphia and attended Baldwin School. She received her bachelor's and master's from Harvard University. She is a former staff writer for the New Yorker magazine and her writings have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Vogue, W, the New York Times Book Review, and Airmail. Her books include the, not, the, the National Book Award nominated memoir, Russian, Russian Journal, the novel Sarah Phillip, the short story collection, Interesting Women, and the novel, Lost Hearts in Italy. Her latest book, which we will be avidly talking about tonight, is Red Island House, which was published this year, a travel epic set in the African nation of Madagascar, which examines post-colonial themes of class, and race and fantasies of tropical paradise through the eyes of an adventurous Black American heroine called Shay. Now, Miss Lee, to start things off, and I hope I'm not um, throwing you off too much, but I was going over some some former interviews that you've done, uh -huh. and in one one of the interviews, you had commented. What I like to investigate when I write is what people dream about. What, what fantasy, fascinates me is the fantasy, the dream of being away and the state of being foreign, of being a part of being a part. And I'm going to follow that up with another quote from the book. A story will tell itself. Ooh, <laughs> that's very interesting. And I, I you know, I'm, I'm quite sure that I'm being co-signed by our, our other members uh, with Red Island House. It's, it, 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 it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a mystery. It's a bit of a fantasy. And I feel that you put a lot of yourself into your writing. And admittedly, this is the first book that I've read of yours, and I'm I'm very curious to read um, Sarah Phillips because you seem to go into autobi autobi autobiographical works of yourself and memoirs. So I know I've, I've thrown a lot at you. So if anything that you would like to elaborate on, hmm, that's really interesting. Um, I think that I've always been interested in, well, I'm always interested in things that are far away and things that are quite near. It's, it's funny because I, I'm often writing books. I, I live abroad. I'm a Black American woman from Philadelphia, which is you know, the most ordinary place you could be from, and a minister's daughter from Philadelphia. But I, I, you know, I do travel a lot. I live in Italy. I married into an Italian family. So I have this far away life. And as a child, I always dreamed of, of traveling, of being far away. But I also find that as a writer, and I write about that a great deal, the, the fact of being foreign, of being an outsider, which is kind of, well, we can talk about this later, but I think it's also part of, of uh, Part, part of being Black and American a certain way, you, you feel so much like an outsider sometimes, so we're very much, you know, in part of the history of America. But um, I always dreamed of traveling and being far away. And so I, you know, I wrote a great deal about my experiences traveling. I wrote fiction and nonfiction. But the more you travel and the more you live away from what is familiar to you from birth, the more interesting things that are that were home things to you become. So I always go back and forth in my writing. When I wrote Sarah Phillips, which is about a little black girl growing up in Philadelphia, the minister's daughter, very autobiographical, I just come back from living in Russia um, for a year as an exchange student. I wrote my first book about 
that, about that experience of being completely outside of anything anybody knew about, because this was at the very end of the, of the Soviet Union. And so not many Americans, especially young Americans, had been in the Soviet Union. So this was very foreign book, this book about this very foreign experience. But when I was there, I was always thinking about Philadelphia. Uh, and kind of, it became more and more interesting to me, all the things of my childhood, all of the people I knew, the fact that, you know, I'd grown up in this church in this black neighborhood that we had, you know, gone through the period of, of many black kids in Philadelphia going to, you know, integrate white schools. So that became my second book after the book about being far away. And I, I tend to go back and forth between writing about America and writing about being far and elsewhere. So I guess you could say Madagascar is the furthest away I've been and gone and written about. And now I'm at work on a memoir again about Philadelphia. So, <laughs> so I go back and forth. <laughs> yes, now in regards to uh, Red Island House, I had heard you say that you had a little bit of trepidation in regards to writing this that you felt that you didn't know enough about Madagascar, even though you've been there numerous times, and that you wanted to be respectful of what you wrote in regards yeah, to the communities there, the people there, the terrain, the languages. Yeah, I, I, yeah that's absolutely right. Um, I've been there many times for the over the last 15 years I've spent part of almost every year there obviously not last year because everything all the borders are closed right now. Uh, so I do, you know, I have friends there I have lived there for you know numerous uh, for months out of you know out of almost every year, yet I always felt like an outsider as you know, someone who doesn't speak the language while well, the language is incredibly complex, the culture is incredibly rich and complex. And uh, so in this period of history and our, our culture, when we're very much thinking about who has the right to talk about things, you know, who has the right to a narrative, you, you know, you, I just stop and consider, do I have a right to write about this country? I'm ignorant as I am, although I know a lot more than a lot of people. And so I held back for a long time, for years in writing about Madagascar. But then the stories began to pile up in my mind. I began to put them together into fiction and I couldn't resist. So I thought the only way that someone as an outsider, who is a foreigner can write about a country is to be respectful and to try to learn as much as you can about that country, but also to kind of to stay in the space of being a foreigner. So if you notice Red Island House is, is about foreigners in Madagascar, what happens to them, you know, what they dream about in Madagascar. They think, you know, the people in my book think Madagascar is a paradise. They can do what they want and they end up in all sorts of predicaments. So, that's the space I say, the space of the foreigner. I'm not trying to write as a person from Madagascar because I couldn't do it with any kind of respect. Right. And with Shay, the main character, I mean, I love the way that you wrote this because, you know, Shay, we, we experienced the evolution of Shay uh, being the African-American that wasn't too familiar with, with Africa outside of what she, she had read until she's actually there and she's, she's married to uh, an Italian who has this house, who built this house and she feels that some things are not right with it. And it's just, uh, it's very, it's written very richly. I mean, you some, sometimes you feel that you're actually there experiencing what Shay is going through. And then just the way that Shay observes in and out of the short stories that's been written, you know, and she's like, I feel that she's an observer of a lot of these, these stories that she's, you know, that she comments about. Yeah. And just the actual evolution of her. Yeah, that's so interesting. And it was very, it's so perceptive of you to see that. Um, I was 
thinking about making this book into a collection of sort of random short stories about Madagascar. But then I began to realize that the stories held together, they all had one theme. And this is that theme of people from the outside of this kind of neo-colonial, uh, neo-colonialism is kind of as expressed in different ways. And I began to realize that the only thing to hold stories like that together would be one person. And so that one person is Shay, who's my character. She's also my point of view, obviously. But she, so I created her as a person who starts out as kind of naive, although she thinks she's very, you know, she knows a lot about the world. She's quite young. And she, you know, immediately is faced with a situation with a country that she can't, that takes her outside of anything that she ever knew, although it feels somewhat familiar, kind of go in the insight. This is, I mean, she, she grows up during the book. And, uh, and at the end, you know, you don't really know what's going to happen with her, but, uh, uh, but you feel that she has gone on a journey. And that journey is what holds all the stories together, is that Shay has grown up. And that's part of, you know, part of her adventure. Well, I know our members are biting at the bit in regards to talking with you and, and, and asking you questions. So sure. either you can speak up, members, or you can write your question in the chat and I can read it. So. Yeah, go right ahead. Now I'm waking up. So <laughs> it's very nice to be talking to you. So please feel free to unmute yourself. And I did. Thank I you. Uh, I I was very intrigued with the way in which you knitted. I, I felt like the novel was, um, this is an image from my youth. My grandmother used to make us crochet little squares and then she would put the squares, uh, crochet the little squares that we made into an afghan. And so that's really the way that I saw this, that there were each um, story was a little square and then Madagascar was basically the, the quilt. But I also saw and felt pretty strongly what a fabulously detailed and clear description you made of a long-term human commitment. And I, I'm, I'm almost tempted to say that this was a love story. Well, that's an interesting, the interesting way of looking at it. Yeah, I never thought of that, but I think it's really good what you're saying. It, it is, it is, it is a, a love story. You know, the, well, you know, the thing is that, she, well, I don't want to give too much away about the plot. And I don't know if you've all read it or not, but, oh, yeah. you know, kind of first, okay, so it goes through shades. Oh, yeah, go for it. <laughs> Yeah, no, well, Shay's marriage is, you know, it's kind of a fun, it's, Shay's marriage is kind of an under, an undercurrent in this entire thing. But the real marriage that Shay is going, going through is, in fact, the love, I mean, the love affair, the marriage, it's, it's her love affair in marriage with Madagascar, um, which I didn't think of. You just brought this to mind. And I think you're absolutely right. You know, yeah, I always discover things when I talk to people. <laughs> And that, that is, it's absolutely true. It is a love affair with, uh, with Madagascar in various, you know, a love-hate affair. She, she's not, she doesn't hate it, but she goes through a lot of pain because of it. Um, but she is discovering herself and discovering the country. Pam, is there something that you want to say? I see you unmuted yourself. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted um, to say this about the foreign oh. part. Um, your, your focus on how the people that are central to the, to all these stories are people who are not, uh, as we say here in, in South Carolina, they're, they're not born here. So they're, they're come here, they're all come here, they're foreigners. And there's a different relationship with the country and there's a different understanding of how things are interpreted and how they, they're seen. But what, what also came to my mind was many years ago, I went to Ethiopia and learned 
that the word that the, the Amharic word for foreigner was helpless. That when you are in a new place and don't know the language and the, that you're you're really culturally compromised seriously. Yeah. And I thought about that from the position of all of these people who had come who were not native to Madagascar, that they were compromised. They saw, and particularly Shay's husband, saw all of it through such an entirely different lens. I mean, it was, he was in another, he was in another place. She lived in one Madagascar and he lived in another Madagascar. Yeah. No, I, I absolutely, I, I agree with you. Yeah, it's, that's such an interesting idea. Um, I think that the foreign, the foreigners that I, and I'm writing, you know, mainly I'm focusing on foreigners in Madagascar, they are helpless without knowing it. They think that they have the power because they're the Europeans. They're the ones with much more money. They're the ones who can come and dig up the land and do what they want, uh, what they think they want. Um, and they, so they feel that they have power, but in fact, they're being regarded as the, by the local people as the helpless ones, in fact. And I think that by the end of the book, you begin to understand that, you know, the very weakness of their, you know, of the connection of a lot of people, you know, to, to themselves, to, you know, to, to what is a really good life and to, to the country. And they're, in some ways overpowered by the country. If you notice that most, most of the stories, I didn't even recognize as I put together a lot of stories from, uh, from you know, from there are composites of things that I heard, anecdotes and things. And my editor said, well, all these stories end terribly for, for the, there are all these love stories that end in disaster, that, that end in disaster for the helpless ones, for the outsiders who come in. And, you know, and try to, you know, try to find paradise. They think they can do what they want. They found women, they found, you know, a perfect life where they don't have to work very hard. No, they end up in some way kind of disgraced or, or sick or, you know, or even being killed. And this uh, sometimes it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, they are the helpless ones. They're much weaker than the people who are living on the land whom they think of as, you know, beneath them. So it's, it's you, you know it is quite quite interesting and perceptive. The story that I that really um, set me off to uh, writing the book is a story that I mentioned in at the very beginning, which is the tale of Libertalia. Um, I was uh, I when I first got to Madagascar, I saw this restaurant, this pizzeria that had a pirate's head on the outside. It was just run, this little place that was run by, you know, local people that had a pirate's head. It was called Libertalia. And I said, what is this place? And then I was told this legend that in back in the 1600s, pirates who really did come to Madagascar always from Europe and from the Caribbean, um, they, they came from the Caribbean, which is very long, but they, they often came. They had uh, come to a certain part of the north of Madagascar and they found it so beautiful. They liked the women so much. They liked the whole landscape. They thought that they could make a paradise for themselves. That's, that was the whole idea of the book. And it would be a place where they could be free to do exactly what they wanted, Libertania and Liberty. And so they did, they founded this colony. And for a while, everyone, all the tribes people around them were very patient with them. And then at a certain point, they just lost their patience and they burned the whole place down and killed the pirates. So that, that is the story of Libertalia. And I began to, that stuck in my mind, this legend, uh, which is very, it was just kind of all over the place there. And it's only in one book that I found in, in England, uh, in, in English literature. But it, it does exist in, you know, written in English. And uh, I began to look around me and I saw all of these kind of similar things where people would arrive. They'd arrive from usually from France or Italy or Germany, not so much from America because it's very far. Um, so they would arrive, particularly men would arrive and they would think, oh my gosh, it's paradise here. I will live here and I will do exactly as I want. I have young girls. I will eat you know, I don't know, fruit all day long, I'll fish, I'll do what I please. And it always ended up terribly. 
for them so many times. I saw story after story. So that began, that was kind of the basis for writing this book that I began to think these ideas of paradise and somehow always ruined by man's interpretation of it. Pam, I'm gonna have you go ahead. You've been waiting patiently. Um, well, first I wanted to say to Ms. Lee, thank you so much for being here. It's such a fabulous opportunity to get to speak with you and in, in real time about your work, work of art, your literature. Um, and thank you to Georgette for arranging this, like what a coup. So, <laughs> um, and I guess the what you just said, um, you know, it's just kind of interesting to me that in the current political situation in this country, liberty is a word that gets used very similarly by some people to mean the right to do anything you want to anyone, anywhere you want. <laughs> um, so that's, that has a certain uh, currency right now. Um, but I guess I was, um, I was really um, struck by in the book about um, sort of the attitude of um, Bertine and other people who were indigenous who lived there um, uh, to the way that the, what did you call them, Ruth? The come, come there or? Come y'all. Okay. The way it's they. A gullah. It's a come, gullah term. Come, yeah. Oh, it's a gullah term. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. The way right. they exercise what they perceive as power through their money or whatever. Um, because it's a kind of, it, it's an, it, it's a very, it seemed to me a very nuanced, attitude that the people who you know the people who are native to that country have to the way some of the kind of crazy activities and um like that like that german lady who lectures shay about how she should treat her servants and they're going to steal from you and blah 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 and she's so kind of completely oblivious of her colonialism you know her her way of seeing things and so I, I just found the way the Bertine and others kind of see that and deal with that is really interesting. Um, and I'll connect that to the ending. Um, you know, that last scene where Shay goes to see this young woman and her baby. And um, um, I mean, I just, I was, it was one of those books where I was like, no, don't leave me here, <laughs> you know? Um, because you kind of, I felt like you kind of left it a little open as to sort of what next and it, but it seemed to relate to that idea of, you know, for Shay, there's always this kind of um, sikomachia, I don't know what the right term is, you know, of like, I don't belong here, I'm not one of these people, but I'm trying to be respectful of them, but I'm not, you know, but I obviously have a lot more privilege than they do. And this baby seems to be sort of the crux, like what, you know, the dream that um, she has of the baby as a grown man talking to her, like, I felt like there was, I needed another chapter to find, you know? So I, I totally get why you left it there, but um, I wondered, can you talk about your choice to do that a little bit? Oh, that's so interesting. Um, I felt that it ended just naturally there. I couldn't, you know, you know, books to me are almost like, you know, when you have children and they grow up and you somehow know there's nothing more <laughs> that, you, that, you, that you can do with them, you know, in terms of forming them. Um, I, I felt that that I wanted to leave it kind of open. I, you know, as you, as you, as you said, I wanted to leave it open. And uh, interestingly enough, I couldn't, for a long time, I couldn't think of an ending to the book. I was feeling that the book was very sad in terms of the fact that it was kind of going, I saw it as almost like a paradise lost story that it was going through all these, it starts out as being sort of a place that's, you know, that's fresh and fairly not polluted. And it gets more and more like full of sex tourists and pollution and things. And, uh, and it becomes very sad towards the end. But then I was trying to racking my brains to think how to how to um, kind of bring it about some idea of redemption. And then it began to occur to me that there are these stories. I went back to the story of the children about the illegitimate children on the island. And I, it began to occur to me that the thing that 
is positive, that's kind of offers redemption in these stories of colonialism, of plundering, of violation of nature, maybe. A new culture is always inevitably created, no matter where you go, whenever invaders come into a, to a country, whatever country it is, there's always some kind of mixing. There's always some kind of, I think Shay, I believe says that, you know, or someone says it, you know, you, you can come into a country, but the country comes into you as well. It comes into your bloodline. It always does. And that creates whatever, I mean, however much sadness and pain there is, there's always kind of a joy and possibility in birth, in starting something new, in this kind of creolization, creole culture that's kind of being created between the locals, between the people, the indigenous peoples and the people who came as invaders. There is a newness to it that may offer hope of a new culture. I mean, I think of... Um, Oh God, goodness, you know, my brain is going, but I, I you know, I think of how much literature, uh, you know, has come out of that particular, you know, Derek Wall, think of it, if there hadn't been, you know, think of, think of creativity that's come out of mixing cultures. Uh, it's just, it always happens. It happens everywhere. There's destruction, there's blood, there's misery, but there's also new hope and light. And so that's why I wanted to end the book on a birth on, on Shay seeing something that might offer redemption in, uh, you know, in, even if her own life is, you know, is sad, there's broken things in her life, there's, but she's also, she also sees some form of, of future of going on. And so that offers a little bit of, that offers more hope. So, yeah, you know, I never thought of writing another chapter. It's really, it's interesting. I just felt like the book was done there and that was it. I could not for the life of me think of anything else. No, it was a masterful ending. It just, to me, that's a mark of a great book when you're like, no, I want more. <laughs> so thank you for your response. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little confused because I thought that the end was what she was planning to do and how she thought it would happen. I didn't get a sense that it that it was re that it was a actual activity. No, she's it's not. It's not. You're right. It's it's not. It's not right. I mean, she's she's planning this in her mind, but she's kind of oh, already okay. on, on different levels, imaginative levels. Because, and I think that one of the things she learned in Madagascar is that there are all sorts of different realities. Like she found the figure yes. that out in the first story so she is you're absolutely right she is imagining this she's yes. imagining okay. a kind of redemption at okay. the end she's hearing voices basically yeah okay thank, thank you. you i appreciate yes. that thank you for clarifying that we have another member uh crystal gathers thank you for coming and thank if you princess. have any if you have any questions please unmute yourself and speak otherwise you can put your um your question in the chat if you don't want to be heard. Now, I wanted I wanted you to talk a little bit more about Christos. I of of the of the people that we get introduced to, he's one of the ones that I found the most fascinating, I guess I, I was struggling for a word, but he stayed with me throughout the whole book and I really wanted to know what he was just um so emblematic of evil I could I could almost see the the pitchfork and the <laughs> so tell me more about him and and where he came from um, you, you know you know I I as I said these are composite characters so I just kind of picked something here there were so many people were, that I encountered who were abusive in their minds to, I mean, had, who were, you know, very, I, I think of them, you know, I said, Shay thinks of him as, as the, you know, he was the, the overseer. He was the, the, you know, the petty guy who was not exactly a slave owner. He was the guy kind of in between. And he was also kind of like a second in command on a pirate ship. He was, you know, I, I just tried to make a composite of all the obnoxious, 
European, <laughs> horrible European men that I encountered over the years and kind of put, the, put it together into a, a possible character. So, um, yeah. And so, you know, you, 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 you did a good to... job. <laughs> I'm glad he stayed with you. But I, I mean, I felt like some of his power was that he did immerse himself in the culture of the people who lived there um, and sort of mediated for someone like Senna and also for Shay when she's new. Um, so it, it's that sort of being willing to delve in and yet be very comfortable with exploiting people too and that his power came from that. Yeah, he had power. Uh, yeah, the, well, he 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 dealt in magic. I mean, he was also, you know, this it is a story about about magic, about particular, um, you know, about using black magic, about sorcery, which is really rampant in in not just in Madagascar, but in a lot of Indian Ocean places, and also in the Caribbean. You know, it's and so he was using it, he was involved in it. And so he was kind of using the powers of the place and also abusing them at the same time. So that's, uh, that's possibly why he, he ended up getting, uh, you know, getting uh, chased away and you know, losing, his, losing his power in that house. But um, you know, I wanted the house to, you know, to have a familiar spirit. So <laughs> it was a bad, a bad spirit. So, but I have to say that, yeah, as I said, ma magic sorcery is rampant, is believed in. I have seen things in Madagascar that I cannot explain. And so, you know, and I'm not particular, I'm a very level-headed person, but there are things that I cannot explain in any rational way that I've seen, you know, in Madagascar and other, in other African countries as well. So, uh, you know, so I wanted to give that impression to try to convey what it is like when you feel as if you are kind of living in different, you know, in places where worlds kind of overlap and where they're, you know, the inexplicable becomes, you know, becomes visible and part of, part of your experience. I love how Bertine took control over the situation and just like basically we're going to take care of this. And I felt that she was a very strong character and uh, my daughter and I had a discussion about this last night and she was, you know, she was still going through the book and Zora, you can elaborate if you want, but, you know, she was questioning me about her. She hadn't finished the book yet. And she was saying, oh, I wonder what's going to happen to her. I said, be patient. She comes back. <laughs> Even though she does come back and she's deceased. <laughs> But, but, but how Shay, you know, reflects on her life and and her experiences with her. Yes, that, that was a very close relationship. And, you know, and it, again, it sort of talked about, it sort of reflected the idea of power in that I, you know, that I play with in book because, because Bertine was a powerful one. Bertine was ostensibly a servant. Bertine was a woman who, you know, was one of the poorest women in a really poor country. She worked all day long. She was basically somebody who worked for Shay and her husband, but at the same time, you know that she was also some incredibly powerful personage. And even amongst the people, you know, the people, the local people, she had this great power and she had power over Shay and she had so much confidence that she didn't even, she didn't even, you know, even seem to be bothered particularly by the idea that she was actually, you know, actually on a lower social scale European style than, uh, you know, by European standards than, 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 you know, than Shay. The two of them were friends and equals, but in some ways, Bertina was much more important and powerful. And Shay knows that. Shay knows that all the way through the book, that Bertina was like an empress, you know, a queen. So, and I base her on a friend of mine. She is one of the characters in my really did very much portray as a, as a, you know, a person who was based, based on a person I know, and I knew and loved a friend of mine, a dear, dear friend of mine. And so, yeah, so, yeah, so that's, you know, most of, as I said, most of the people are composites, but, but Bertine is very much based on a friend of mine who did die, who did, uh, who was very sad and she's very much missed. And so, um, and I have an interesting story about that in that, my son, Charlie, I have a son and daughter. My son, Charlie, went back for some, managed to go to Madagascar this spring. It was very difficult to travel, but he went. And he went 
to Bertin's grave. Bertin, who's, who has another name in real life, he traveled with Bertin's son, who was his friend. And he said, mom, you can't imagine what this trip was like. They took a boat, they took a rickshaw, they traveled on foot for like miles and miles in the middle of nowhere. He's no, and, she, and then they went to her village in the center of the big island and met her, her big sister who was someone in a, or big, a big sister of some, maybe an adopted sister, a woman who was in her nineties. And this was, and Charlie, my son Charlie said, you know, this woman just got up, greeted me, said, okay, now we're going to see the grave. And the grave was across a river that they had to ford with, they had to, they had to go with stuff on their heads. They had to go to the top of the mountain. He said, this woman in her nineties, just, just, you know, was faster than I was. She just like ran to the top of the mountain. And there on the mountain top was a stone, you know, was a stone tomb. They sat down, they, greeted her, they poured out drinks, they sat and told her what she'd been doing, they carried greetings from me. And so it was all very satisfying in some ways. I mean, I will do that trip one day, but it was really an odyssey, my, my son did, so. I thought it was very well represented in this, the, 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 what you shared with us that she did. Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, that was something I fans, but oddly enough, you know, sometimes uh, real life imitates fiction, because after I'd written it, my son, had, he just decided to go on this trip <laughs> to, to her, and it was, it was like one of the hardest things he'd ever done, you know, he had no idea that it was going to be quite so, such an epic, you know, encounter with, uh, with the wilderness, so it was quite something. Yeah. Laura, would you like to say something? I thought it could have easily have gone the other way. Um, at the end of the story, in, in the beginning of the book, when um, Shay hugged her when she was leaving and called her her sister, I, the way that it was written, I kind of thought, well, it was it too soon? How do we know? What, like, what is, was she scheming? Um, and then you know, as the book progressed and we didn't hear as much from Bertine, it, it was kind of hard to tell. But um, in the story where Bertine died, you were kind of able to see that their relationship really carried Shay, the way that Bertine really kind of guided her for years. And her guidance helped her so much. And even more so because when Bertine died, that was really the downfall um, so much, so much badness happened after Bertine's death, um, obviously with her marriage and so on. But I mean, Shay pretty much refused to go back for so long. And I just, I, I was, I was so happy that Shay had Bertine and I, I didn't even realize how important, how important she was. Yeah, she was, yeah, she was in some ways the mainstay of the book. And I, it was hard for me to write. I didn't want, you know, I, as I, I would, you know, write these chapters and occasionally my editor would say things like, well, we want to see more Bertine. But I said, I don't want to have Bertine popping up like the typical magical Negro figure and everything and giving words of wisdom every minute, you know, to Shay. So I kind of held off on having her to appear too many times. And then I wanted to dedicate a whole, you know, a whole piece to her, you know, to their relationship, to kind of exploring what, you know, what, you know, what it was like, and this kind of, you know, this kind of, this kind of balance between the, the person who was of the land, which was Bertine, and then the outsider, who was Shay, and how in some ways they kind of joined together. Mm -hmm. Again, I feel that you are being respectful. I try, tried to be. <laughs> you try, you know, I, it's, it's really, it's tough because I, I feel as if I still feel like, in, you know, there, Madagascar is, is a really literary country. I mean, it's, it's the African country that had the first African creative writing magazine, literary magazine in the, in the end of the 1800s. It's, it has a long, long literary tradition of great poets and then a long oral poetry tradition, but um, and so, and it's got great writers today, but the language is very hard to translate. A lot of the writers write in French, but they're not known outside of, maybe outside of uh, Francophone Africa, maybe a little bit in France, but there are some magnificent poems and poets. 
And the first Malagasy novel ever translated in English was published about three years ago um, by, I'm gonna try to have a conversation with this guy. I'll let you guys know. Um, but by a young Malagasy guy named, um, his name is pa Patrick Naivo. His real name is very, very, very long. Um, and it's called Beyond the Rice Fields and it's beautiful. Oh, yeah. But it, yeah, have you, you've read it or have you heard of it? Because you, you referenced it in your note. Yeah, yeah, he's really, it's a wonderful book. And I felt embarrassed that my book from the outsider has gotten more attention than his book from the, you know, written from the heart by the insider. So, I, you know, you, you feel, you know, you feel privileged to, you know, to live in, you know, to live in a certain way. And I feel, you know, I feel it's not guilty exactly, but I feel sad that this beauty is not being seen more by the world. So I would like to try to, you know, I, I want to try to at least try to, you know, to publicize it a bit more. So yeah, you try to be respectful and you try to always understand how fortunate we are, how fortunate I am <laughs> in, in getting attention. So, I, I wanted to go back to Bertine. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Georgia, go ahead. I just want to acknowledge our, our executive director of the AB Research Center oh. for African-American History and Culture, uh, Dr. Tamara Butler has joined us. If you'd like to say hello, Dr. Butler. Hello. 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 I'm just, I'm just going to say hi. I didn't want to turn, turn the camera on. We're getting a thunderstorm coming through Somerville. So I'm just listening, but thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm excited to be here and listen. Oh, well, thank you so much for inviting me, really. It's it's really, it's a real pleasure. I, I love talking to people who've read the book and really get, I always learn something new when I talk to people who, you know, who think and, and you know, who think they are so creative themselves and in, in interpretations, I learn a lot. So it's, it's, it's a real pleasure. Uh, I should add that um, Dr. Butler is a, also a come here and we are so grateful she, she was, she sort of a comeback here. I, I'm not sure how we describe her, but anyway, we're, we're grateful that she's back in this community, that's for sure. I wanted to go back to Bertine because Shay's fascination with the art that shows the colonialist in the front of the picture in the foreground, but always with a black woman in the background, the cleanup person, the idea person, the person who's operational. And that was Bertine. Yeah. So her fascination with Bertine and her fascination with the art that shows the characterization of Bertine, I thought was very powerful. Well, thank you. I, I thought, I think also it says something about the, what we're always talking about, the balance of power in that book, because, you know, you think of the, the person in the background as being, as being, you know, somehow on a lower level, but in fact, and I, I'm t I took this from a painting that actually we have in my family that is by, um, oh golly, my uh, Laura Wheeler Waring. Um, oh which, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this this painting, which is you know, not one of her best, I have to say, but it's very big, and it's got this this little, this French doll with pink and white face in the front, yeah. and then in the background you see the black yes. doll the servant doll and it terrified me as a child because the servant is so much more absolutely scary more powerful looming over her supposed mistress that you know you you instantly see that there is you know much more power in the, the side that's not supposed to have the power it's supposed to be a slave doll who has no power but in fact she has all the power so I wanted to kind of reference that in, in talking, you know, and in, in describing Bertin. She has much more power than Shay does. But Shay gradually accumulates power as she grows up through the book. She does grow up and she gets smarter, she gets wiser. So one of the other realizations that Shay comes to is the quote where she says, her leisure is built on old crime. And, you know, just the concept of, you know, the colonialism of how that was built. And I'm quite sure in the beginning, she never thought that she would be part of that. But in a way she is. Yeah. And, and how she comes to the realization of that. Yeah, she's complicit. 
in it, in being, in just in being a middle class, you know, a middle class black or white, she's still complicit in having much more privilege than than anybody, you know, anybody on this island where she's kind of going to go on vacation as she, you know, anybody would go to California, I don't know, to the Caribbean or to Hawaii. She is there to enjoy herself. And she's, you know, and she can't help but think, she can't forget it, like all the Europeans around her seem to do, because she knows that her family's past is basically, you know, is basically co connected with similar crimes, similar suffering. And so she's kind of got that in the back of her mind, but at the same time, she's enjoying herself because she's living in, in luxury on a beautiful beach. So that's, you know, part of it is that she must confront her privilege at the same time she's, you know, she's back and forth because she's enjoying herself as well. So it's, uh, and I think that she finally comes to face to face with that in the story that's called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, where there's a, you know, she makes, at least she makes a decision that she, you know, again, that's one of those equivocal things because she makes a decision at the end, she makes a decision to have this young woman sit down as a sex worker, to sit down at her table, but no one is comfortable, not even the young woman at the, after this decision, but she does it. And then she makes another decision not to have any more men who are there on sex tourism, for sex tourism in her house. But it's still a, an equivocal thing because she also knows that that money from those men is sometimes in very many cases, and I know this too, is the only money that's bringing in food to a lot of families and that that girl is doing it. So it's, you know, it's, it's you know, I don't know, what, what would you say 12 in one hand and half in and a dozen in the other? I don't know what to say, but, uh, but she, Shay has to kind of deal with that, you know, that, that paradox that one thing is good in theory, but in practice, there's another thing that, you know, it's bringing in money to, to people who otherwise would have nothing, would be, would be maybe starving. I, I wouldn't want to go, I, I don't want to dominate. Does someone else want to have anything they want to share? I, I don't want to go away from the conversation without commenting on the absolutely uh, devastating view of white men in this book. They are pitiful. They are naked and transparent and powerless and frightening to think that they, in fact, are making the decisions about our lives. I mean, I, I just did not see even the, the Jesuit trained um, Oh, I can't remember his name. Um, oh, the the, uh, the, the it's sort of and the the folklore folklore Lars. Folklore guy, yeah, the folklore. Yes. Yeah. E even he, there were elements of of sadness, but they perceived themselves as being powerful and doing what they wanted to do. When they are absolutely the saddest bunch, I think I've read in a long. I, I was, I okay. actually, and I I did not think I would ever say this in my life. I was actually sorry for them. I, no, I felt I, compassion and sadness because their lives were just so awful and grim. It's kind of, yeah, that's the whole, I think it's a whole paradise story. It's kind of the story of Libertalia all over again, There's in that they, the pirates come in, they think that they found they're plundering and they're taking the women and they're but at the same time they're you know they're they're sad you know they're a kind of a moral rot grows in and it's you know it's again it's a sort of the heart of darkness idea that you know that I, I say that yeah I guess I did give a pretty pretty bad picture of of well European men and women and and it's about people behaving badly foreigners behaving badly in Madagascar basically uh, and she, yeah, she recognizes that and sees it. And uh, and then the one time that she does have a, you know, have compassion for someone, um, for the South white South African guy, whom she is sort of has this, you know, compassionate and interesting relationship. He is basically committing slow suicide. On uh, you know, it's a, it's um, you know, it's part of, it's part of what happens. 
you know, in places like that. I think a kind of rot sets in. So I can't I can't help but make the make a comparison, even though it's a very distant comparison, but probably because I was reading this book, along with looking at this HBO uh, Max um, story called The White Lotus. I don't know if you're familiar oh, with it. I don't know if anybody else. No, I can't see it. I'm dying to watch it, as a matter of fact. People have already, everyone is telling me about it. And when I come back next week, I will immediately watch it. So, so, so tell me, please. Yes, well, it's about these vacationers going to this resort in paradise in Hawaii and how, you know, it's, it's told from a Eurocentric uh, perspective, of course. Uh, there is one uh, African American woman uh, that seems to be compassionate, and pe some people very, very much rely on her and her compassion until she's like enough. But it's just people acting very badly from the hotel staff to the, the vacationers, and on, and it shows a side of you know, the native Hawaiians and what they what they have to do to, in order to survive, to entertain mm. the people. So it's, yeah. your book was very much more interesting. <laughs> interesting. I'm, very, I'm very curious to see, no, very curious to see though. But paradise um, gone bad. That's, that's yeah, the main thing. Right. Yeah, that's, it always fascinated me, the whole idea of paradise, this whole, you know, we say paradise and everybody, even, you know, intellectuals just automatically just say tropical paradise. It's like a, you know, something that falls off everyone's side. But if you think about it, and I've thought a lot about it, uh, paradise, I mean, when people, the places that are defined as tropical paradises, they are absolutely beautiful places, but they're so often places that were former colonies. So they have this history of you know plundering and uh, you know of, of colonial uh, invasion that uh, you know an imperialist you know all sorts of suffering under various empires and yet these are the places that also are these days are always described as tropical paradises and have been in the past too and there's always this dream that you can have what you want do what you want in the middle of beauty and. Uh, and you know, and that's you know, and that's that's you will be taking something from it. As I said, people always wanted to take stuff from Madagascar. They always had these plans for it throughout history, plundering it, taking a lot of women, slavery, you know, slaves. It's you know, na natural things, sapphires these days. They think about oil. You know, it's there's always something, and it's it always ends up all this greed ends up by degrading people. Who, who are so greedy morally, I think. I mean, I don't mean to preach, but I am a minister's daughter, but, but, <laughs> but I don't need, but I, I feel like that's what happens that, you know, people think they can live, just live without paying, paying any dues in paradise. And that, and then inside they begin to crumble away. And that's what happens to a lot of people in Red Island. Pam, you have your hand up? Yeah, so I would just like to see if we can take that idea a little further, maybe. I'm curious, are you, uh, are you maybe saying that the concept of paradise, I mean, I'm thinking Milton and whatever, yeah. is a colonialist concept? I mean, I'm curious because you are um, enlightened by, you know, knowing the literature of people who actually come from Madagascar and you, so yeah. you, you know, you, you're well read in their culture does do do the people who live in these tropical paradises call them paradises do they do they see it that way or is that an outsider's way of seeing those landscapes i think you're yeah that's such an interesting question such a good question i don't think that people who are living there i mean i i cannot speak from the heart of you know someone who who actually grew up and lives in Madagascar. I mean, again, I, I am still an outsider, very much so. But I think that they just think of life as being good and proper when, you know, when they're left alone. I don't think that they think this is paradise, that this is, as a matter of fact, you know, a lot of 
unfortunately these days a lot of people kind of dream of living in america with lots of you know lots of digital devices or something unfortunately but um but no i do not think i do not think that i think that people just think that there is a way of living well you know you live well you have enough to eat you 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 live well with your family the weather is you know good for you but they don't look around and say this is paradise now because mm -hmm. i I thought you, if I understood you earlier, you made a comment about a parallel in the book between the marriage, Senna's actual marriage, I mean, um, Shay's actual marriage to Senna and the sort of um, um, disintegration in a way of um, some aspects of the life there. And you, you, there are parts in the book where you talk about the deforestation and sort of the exploitation of the landscape. Um, but I don't recall any, maybe I just didn't read it carefully enough, but I'm, I don't recall any comments by any of the people who lived there like anger about that or. Well, people are you know, angry about, about the trans yeah. transformation of their homelands. Yeah, you know, people are angry and upset about, well, I mean, we could be talking about what I know about real life Madagascar and what I'm, you know, what I do in the book. Um, which is much more instinctive and, you know, and not particularly well researched. Uh, I think people are definitely angry and upset about about you know seeing things cut down and but on the other hand they're kind of the people I know in in, in the parts of Madagascar I know they're also they also and, and this sounds terrible are also sort of complicit because people kind of the thing is that human nature is the same the world around when people begin to see other people, tourists coming in with, I don't know, head uh, headphones and you know sunglasses and fancy clothes and cars and uh, you know they all want them too. It's human nature. That's what it is. You know you can't just say you know you have to live eternally on a beach in a you know in a in a hut and because it's natural. No, they want exactly what Americans want and have. You know what most Americans, most Chinese, most everybody they want sort of contemporary things, which of course are helping to destroy paradise, the earth, you know, so everybody wants them very much so. So people are annoyed about, and annoyed or upset about this, the fact that their beaches are dirty now and that the trees are being cut down. But at the same time, they all want a motorcycle. They all, they all dream of having a, you know, a big, a big uh, four wheel drive vehicle. That would be their dream. Maybe traveling in airplanes to various places a lot. You know, people, people dream of going to New York. They don't know anything about New York, but gradually, you know, they, they want to listen all the time now to, to American music or, you know, it, so it's, it's um, as I say, it's kind of a shared desire in some ways, although they also know that their country was very good before a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, tourists and especially sex tourists started, started, uh, started coming to it. Well, would you believe it's that time? We've all we've an hour. You want more? <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying myself. We definitely appreciate your time. I mean, I know that yes, you know, you. <laughs> is is um is talking to us from Italy, and it is what time now? It's like one thirty in the morning. <laughs> yeah, that's a, I, I I apologize earlier before some of you. You checked in saying that I'm actually not so coherent <laughs> this time of morning. <laughs> I stopped, my brain kind of stops working around around 10 30 or 11. <laughs> so well, we this has been so enjoyable. Yes, we definitely appreciate the time that you spent with us and to give us a little bit more context of the book, which is, you know, as I said, it, it's a wonderful written epic. Oh, well, thank and you. We, we just, had a wonderful, a to me had to hear a wonderful time reading it and discussing it. And, and we're looking forward. I, I, I was listening to uh, one of the other interviews that you did, and there might be a possibility that it might be coming to the screen, the big screen. I can't say anything, but it's, 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 uh, it's I can't, they, I'm not supposed to say anything, but it, it, there is a definite possibility. Okay, so. well, we'll keep our fingers <laughs> crossed. And and, forward to that all right future works from you also 
Well, thank you so much. This has been, this is really fun too. You know, I, uh, I woke up <laughs> because the questions were so interesting. So thank you for your wonderful questions and interesting comments. And thanks for inviting thank me. You. Yes, thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> you, made, you made my day. <laughs> this is delightful, really delightful. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna, I wanna try to come down to, to, yes, to Charles and oh, so. Yeah. Oh, please. Well, listen, you guys have a have a good evening because I would guess it's just it's just turning into evening there, right? It's yeah. about seven. Yeah. seven. Well, have a great evening. I'm going to get to bed. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Georgia. This was wonderful. This thank was you wonderful. for joining us, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.